Good evening. I want to share a few important tips about the aviation industry. Um, first, welcome to everyone and to this wonderful, wonderful aviation webinar. Here are a few tips. Remember these. The aviation market was valued at 169.72 billion US dollars in 2020. The market is projected to reach about 303 billion US dollars in 2026. That's wonderful growth. Artificial intelligence in the aviation market is expected to have market growth at a rate of 45.8% in the forecast period of 2020 to 2027. Overall employment of airline and commercial pilots is projected to grow 5% from 2019 to 2029, faster than the average for all occupations. And uh, the last point I want to share is the aviation industry supports 87.7 million jobs around the world, either directly within the industry or supported through the industry supply chain aviation enabled tourism sector. So my question to you is, are you positioned, positioning your career directions to leverage this growth in this fantastic industry? This is what we're going to talk about this evening. Hello, I'm Dr. Karen Lynn Daniels Ivy. I am department chair of technology studies at the University of Arizona Global Campus, Ford School of Business and Technology. We are in for a wonderful adventure this evening. Welcome to the Aviation International Picture Your World. The University of Arizona Global Campus has partnered with Captain Willie Daniels of the Shades of Blue and also Metropolitan State University of Denver to host this awesome webinar on the world of aviation. Our special guests of aviation industry experts will take us into career paths across the various aviation market segments of commercial aviation, military aviation, as well as general aviation. Well, I have the pleasure of introducing our MC for this evening, Dr. Emily Matula. Dr. Emily Matula is currently at NASA Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. She's working as an extravehicular activity EVA junior flight controller instructor. In this role, she teaches astronauts how to maintain and put on their suits to go on spacewalks. Isn't that really cool? And she develops the procedures that the crew will use to go out the door, using that term during the mission. Emily earned her undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, her master's degree in space engineering from the University of Michigan, and her PhD in bioastronautics, human space flight at the University of Colorado in Boulder. Her passion is human space flight and making sure that humans can explore the universe as safely as possible. Emily, we are glad you do what you do. And so Ms. Emily, we will turn the floor over to you, Dr. Emily Matula, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Ivy, so much for that introduction. I'm pleased to introduce our first set of presentations for the evening. First, we will be hearing from UAGC President Paul Pesterek and his take on how UAGC fits into the larger picture of aviation and aerospace. Then, Warner Petzold on potential careers path in aviation, followed by Captain Willie L. Daniels, the second um, on the partnership of UAGC and the Shades of Blue. Michael Hayden will review the AV uh, 200 course offerings, and Dr. Pete Limon will present emphasis at UAGC reflecting the at aerospace aviation industry. And finally, Stephanie Recklin will present the aviation offerings at Metropolitan State University of Denver with a brief Q&A session to follow afterwards. And with that, President Paul Besterk. The floor is yours. Emily, thank you very much. Uh, 
I'm very grateful for all of you uh, showing up tonight, both the panelists uh, and all of the students and others who have joined us for this uh, presentation. Uh, I have the privilege of leading the University of Arizona Global Campus, uh, and we're part of the sponsorship for this evening's events. Um, I wanted to say that I have an experience in the aviation and aerospace industry. I was privileged to serve at NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, a number of years ago, and uh, also in the private aviation industry. Um, this is a wonderful industry to be in, wonderful people, and you'll see and hear from today some amazing people, truly amazing people, including uh, an astronaut from NASA, um, people from the Johnson and Glenn Space Centers uh, in, uh, in the U.S. Uh, you'll also hear from people who run aviation authorities and airport authorities uh, throughout the country. Uh, as well as uh, a representative of the Boeing company, uh, one of the largest aerospace companies in the world. Uh, we're honored to have all of these folks with us today. We at the University of Arizona Global Campus uh, support through our degree programs, uh, the aviation industry, um, including uh, the drone, uh, the new developing area of drones, um, we're just very excited to host this tonight, and I want to thank everyone for uh, on our panel for coming out tonight and spending the time to share your experiences with our students and with our uh, friends who are joining us this evening. So thank you all uh, for attending this webinar. Thank you all panelists for being a part of it. I'm very grateful, and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing more about the story. Thank you very much, Paul. And Werner, now the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you, uh, President Paul Pastrick. I appreciate those wonderful words. Uh, and I'm here to uh, talk about careers in aviation. Uh, I know all, oftentimes students and graduates, and um, by the way, I'm Werner. I'm the Employer Outreach Specialist for UAGC. Uh, here in San Diego, and i um, here to talk about careers in aviation, and I'm also 10 years Air Force. So uh, when it comes to careers in aviation, a lot of students and graduates, we ask, you know, what typical career uh, careers do they believe that are available in this uh, field or this industry? So um, just curious what you might think, but in lieu of time, because we're running behind, uh, many of the things that we often think about probably would be things like uh, flight attendants, uh, the mechanics that work on, at the airline industry, uh, you know, things when it comes to packaging and things of that nature, our pilots, obviously, engineers, uh, air traffic control, things of that nature. But are you aware also that we also have in this industry, we have people that do the security for all of the IT that works for uh, air traffic control, or we have people in HR uh, people that work in all types of operation roles and management roles and what have you. So we're here just to mention this to you to think about those careers that would uh, you could apply to uh, and apply your degrees in. And that's the whole purpose of this webinar today. So I uh, just want you to think about that when you're going through this webinar today. And uh, with that, uh, I would like, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Captain Willie Daniels. He's 43 year veteran uh, pilot of the United Airlines, and he's going to discuss things further to you regarding careers in aviation. Captain Daniels. Uh, thank you, Warner. First of all, um, it's a great honor to be here and, and be working with the University of Arizona Global Campus and uh, Metropolitan State University. Uh, for all of those uh, listeners out there, uh, you're going to have a great opportunity to hear a lot of fantastic things. And for those youth out there, it's going to be uh, great for you to pursue a career in the uh, fields of aviation and aerospace. Now, I founded Shades of Blue about 21 years ago, along with a group of airline pilots, engineers, scientists, and educators, with the idea of uh, taking professionals from our working environment into the classrooms, 
K through college to plant the seed with the students about having careers in both aviation and aerospace. Um, not only that, we wanted to be able to uh, expose them to the opportunities and we have created a pipeline in order to get the young people in at an early age, whereby we mentor them, we point them in the right direction, we track them through college. And once they come out of college, we're in a position to run their resumes into the HR departments. Now, I uh, recently retired from United and I actually just started back work again at United this past week. And so uh, I feel sort of like the godfather. Uh, when I get out, they pulled me right back in. So this is a great opportunity. Uh, even though you've retired and finished up a career, uh, you're still, your services are still needed and wanted. And so they invite you to come right back in. Um, I uh, grew up in the Southern California area uh, in the inner city uh, of Pomona, California. Went to elementary, middle school, high school and community college. Uh, out at Mount San Antonio Community College in Southern California. I graduated from there and I transferred here to Denver uh, Metropolitan State University. And that was about 40, almost 45 years ago. It seems just like yesterday. And I spent about a year and a half in school there. And when I graduated from, from Metro State University, I was fortunate enough, it, it was as though um, someone had reached in their pocket and pulled out a set of keys and they handed me a set of keys and said, here are your keys to the world. And I have been traveling ever since then, uh, pretty much all corners of the world. I've been up over the North Pole, South Pole, not over the South Pole, but uh, over South America and Africa and all over the world. It's a great opportunity. Now, I, uh, well, in my career with United Airlines, I had an opportunity. I was picked up initially as a flight attendant for United Airlines, where I worked for about eight and a half years in the back of the uh, cabin. And I learned a lot from working back there in the back from a lot of professionals and the whole works. And then I transitioned initially uh, into the cockpit about eight years after I hired on as a engineer on the Boeing 727. And I flew that for about three years and then transitioned into the, the right seat of the Boeing 727. And I flew that for another two or three years, transitioned into the McDonnell Douglas DC-10 as a first officer uh, flying the right seat of that aircraft for about three years. And then from there on to the Boeing 747-400. And I flew that for 19 years out of Los Angeles. Uh, after that, I transitioned over to the 777. I flew the, the 777 uh, for about six or seven years out of Washington, D.C., and from that point on over to uh, the 787, where I retired off of the 787 uh, last year. Now, with putting Shades of Blue together, uh, we feel that this is a great opportunity to expose the youth to what is a fantastic field. And, and as I indicated earlier, this was a, uh, a great career and I would strongly encourage any student that is interested in participating in this career field to pursue it. Uh, whether, it, as Warner mentioned, if you be in a flight attendant, a mechanic, a pilot, a dispatcher, uh, air traffic controller, uh, all of those uh, working uh, such as Mr. Atlas as the COO of Ontario Airport. You can be involved in the space industry from astronauts to scientists and the whole works. So the sky is not the limit. You choose your own future and, and I would say um, go for it. And, and with that being said, in order to maintain uh, a schedule, uh, we would like to turn it um, over to none other than Mr. Michael Hayden. Um, from the uh, University of Arizona Global Campus. Michael? Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Willie, or uh, Mr. Willie. I appreciate you, Captain Willie. Um, I wanted to really quickly go through a few slides. I think we have some position in aviation fields on our slides that I'd like to share with you first. 
Um, give me one moment, please. So some of the position in the field of aviation, supply chain manager, customer experience officer, chief technology officer, among many more. Um, there's just, this field is so big. And again, as Dr. Ivy had first mentioned, uh, it's unbelievable how many different fields there are and what it takes. So what it takes to, to become this, um, you know, needed for a job in av aviation, you need good communication skills, critical thinking skills, good people skills, leadership, be a team player, time management, positive attitude, global skills, flexibility skills, math computer skills, and specialized training. I would like to introduce you to our, our aviation course at UAGC. We are very, very happy to have partnered with uh, M0A as uh, they've, we've teamed up with an amazing partner to provide our students the opportunity to, be, to become commercial drone pilots. The aviation industry is growing at an exceedingly high rate. And there is one segment of the aviation industry that is growing exponentially and that is the unmanned aviation segment that is known as the drone industry. So the use of drones is growing so rapidly in delivery, transportation, real estate, uh, from marketing to law enforcement, and they're used in so many different industries, agriculture, internet services, and so much more. So as a commercial drone pilot, you'll be provided with many new opportunities for jobs. Our AVI 200 course can be used as an elective in a course of study or as part of an emphasis program that Dr. Lamone will discuss. Uh, this is an exciting course where you can become a commercial drone pilot and get college credit. We have a, a really big announcement. Um, the University of Arizona Global Campus has become a trusted minister for all recreational drone flyers. So basically the FAA in has a collaboration with the FAA and industry and we provide this recreational UAS safety test. Uh, and it's basically an educational safety material product, product that students will get a certificate. And we're very happy to support the community and the FAA. So you can go to our website, which is www.com. Uh, trust.uagc.tech. I have to fix that slide, but www.trust.uagc.tech and you can get your trust cert, earn your trust certificate. Um, and that is, that is the information that I have. Dr. Lamone, uh, I'm going to pass it on to you. Well, um, hello there, everyone. My name is uh, Dr. Lamone. I am part of the drone team. I am the lead faculty for the cyber and data security and technology. And I'm going to discuss uh, some of the emphasis that U UAGC offers uh, the first one is the unmanned um, or undergraduate uh, drone and unmanned aerial vehicle. That's what UAV stands for. And we have a marketing emphasis. Okay, so basically this course is basically just to discover how drones are changing the marketing industry, providing new ways and tools for marketeers and brands to gather data, launch products, and engage uh, with their audience. This emphasis provides a foundation for you to build upon to create unique campaigns for um, products and businesses by integrating drones to gather data and integrate it for use in marketing and advertising. Um, one thing we do also offer in this course is you're going to um, uh, examine the FAA part 107. Um, it is uh, to get you certified uh, in the, as a, a commercial drone operator. And um, so it's very exciting. Next slide, please. So some of the um, courses that, that go along with this emphasis here, we have several courses uh, and one of them is the AVI 200. And this is the first course. So oh, we have five emphasis and the AVI 200 you're going to take with each emphasis. So uh, Mr. Hayden did talk a little bit about it. Just prepare students to take the uh, federal aviation FAA um, exam in, in commercial drone operations. Um, so uh, next slide, please. All right, so one of the courses that's paired with the marketing emphasis is the Business 317, Introduction to Advertising. So as you can see that drones are very useful in the world of advertising. Uh, this course is designed to introduce students to the field of advertising um, as a promotional force with emphasis on institutions, planning, strategic practices, and tactical decisions made by advertising and executives. Next slide, please. 
And the uh, other course that's paired with the, the marketing emphasis is um, Business 330, which is Principles of Marketing. And this basically is, is, is a course that um, teaches the student uh, about producers and goods and services to determine and satisfy the wants of society and examining of internal and external environments that impact marketing decisions, uh, the basic elements of um, a marketing program and issues in ethics and social responsibility. Uh, next slide, please. This here, our next slide is the uh, drone entrepreneur emphasis. So again, we have another emphasis on, this is the second one out of the five. Uh, and, you know, in the drone market, you know, obviously it's been growing rapidly with various industries integrating drones into their daily operations. So we decided to create uh, an emphasis in drone um, entrepreneur emphasis. Next slide, please. Uh, again, uh, this emphasis, uh, all students will take the AVI 200 uh, commercial drone pilot, which again, it's going to prepare them for the Federal uh, Aviation Administration uh, uh, exam. Next slide, please. Uh, this, uh, the entrepreneur uh, emphasis has uh, two courses paired with it. And one of them is known as the, or is the introduction to entrepreneurship. Uh, this dynamic course is based on a unique model of entrepreneurial methodology developed by Forbes School of Business and Technology at the University of Arizona Global Campus. Um, next slide, please. Business 433 is paired with the entrepreneurial emphasis course uh, is designed to provide students perspective entrepreneurs with information and tools for evaluating opportunities for starting a new firm, how to choose markets uh, for entry, when to enter, and what resources and capabilities it will um, take to enter and provide a platform for future growth. Uh, next slide, please. Now we have our third emphasis is uh, the, the um, emphasis in cybersecurity and infrastructure. Um, the drone market has been uh, rapidly growing with various industries integrating drones into their daily operations. Homeland security and emergency uh, management is one area of interest. Um, so um, emergency preparedness, planning and security also go hand in hand with uh, homeland security and drones provide a new opportunities for aspiring entrepreneurs in the area of homeland security and emergency management. Next slide, please. Again, uh, with this emphasis, all students will take the AVI 200 and uh, pass the certification. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the courses that uh, is paired with this is the course uh, introduces the, the students with system security, confidentiality, confidentiality, integrity, and availability, which is the, the CIA of the security domains. Um, and it also teaches them IT security framework and a little bit about cryptography. Next slide, please. Risk management and infrastructure is another course that's paired with cyber, the cybersecurity emphasis. And basically it just builds on management concepts learned in the CYB 300, uh, which is introduced to cyber and data security. And they also get a little bit of IT governance and uh, frameworks. Next slide, please. Now we move into our emergency management uh, emphasis. And uh, here you're going to add to your uh, uh, bachelor's of arts in social and criminal justice degree and uh, with building on Homeland Security and emergency management. Okay, so here um, you'll learn a little bit about cyber crimes, Homeland Security and how drones are used in the uh, world of Homeland Security and how they help. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the other courses uh, um, emphasis, obviously the emergency management. So they're going to take the first course AVI 200 as always. Next slide, please. And the first course that they're gonna pair with the emergency management emphasis is the HSM 318, Emergency Planning and Response. And it's just gonna provide students with some uh, skills needed to develop comprehensive plan for risk analysis, threat assessment, staffing and emergency operations, and uh, so forth. So this is a, another good course that's paired with that emphasis. Next slide, please. Uh, we also have the HSM 433, Counterterrorism and Intelligent Analysis. And this is also paired with the emergency ma management emphasis. And it's just going to um, cover um, counterterrorism, including the evolution of counterterrorism and the specifics of the topology and anatomy of terrorist operations. Next slide, please. Uh, with this emphasis, you're going to get a, a, another course, and it's known as Introduction to Cybercrime. And it's just going to focus on the technical aspects of digital crime, as well as behavioral aspects of computer hackers, virus writers, terrorists, and other offenders. Next slide, please. And we move into our final emphasis known as the 
uh, criminal justice drone pilot emphasis. Um, here, you go, um, students will expand their degree um, with the with you know introduction to the field of criminal justice and the uses of drones in crime prevention and crime scene investigation, which is very interesting. Um, they're also going to examine the FFA Part 107 um, exam. Next slide, please. Again, they're all they're going to take the ABI 200, and this is you know of course it's uh, demanded of every emphasis, and they will pass it. Next slide, please. Uh, they're going to move into the Criminal Justice 201, which is Introduction to Criminal Justice, and it just considers processes for law enforcement, judiciary corrections, and juvenile justices. In addition, the course considers criminal justices issues application for criminology. It's going to be paired with uh, this emphasis. Next slide, please. Uh, crime Prevention, CRJ um, 305, and it just explores strategies of crime prevention, including programs designed to reduce opportunities to commit crime, uh, programs to alleviate demoralizing community, social, and economic conditions that foster criminal behavior, and programs to improve police committee cooperations. Next slide, please. Uh, CJ311, CRJ311 Forensics, another interesting course. Uh, forensic science applies scientific methodolo methodology to crime scene investigation and crime solving. Sounds like a good crime book. Um, so uh, next slide, please. And this is basically uh, all of the emphasis that we offer here, as well as the uh, uh, links to get to them. So hopefully you guys will be able to, to watch this at a later time. Um, and just remember, take your education and your career to a higher level with online unmanned aircraft systems, drone pilot course and emphasis offerings at UAGC. And just make sure that you're, you know, just, just step out of the box, explore exciting, rapidly growing field um, that's, that's potentially changing businesses. If you want any more information, contact uh, us at the University of Arizona Global at 1-866-711-1700. And our website's listed below at www.uagc.edu. And last but not least, just some of the career paths if you guys are looking for some, uh, you know, in agriculture, conservation, delivery, fulfillment, disaster mitigation, drone farming, um, and so forth. And um, again, you can also do journalists, wildlife conservatives. Um, and thank you very much. Uh, that concludes my uh, introduction to the emphasis at UAGC. Now I'm going to uh, introduce Dr. Stephanie Reichlin um, and uh, she will take over. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Lamone. And thank you for calling me a doctor. I actually only have a bachelor's, but you can call me doctor all day. <laughs> okay. um, hi, I'm Stephanie. I'm from uh, the MSU Denver Aviation and Aerospace Science Department. And I'll, I'll take the next slide, please. So what you guys are going to see on this next slide is uh, everything that we offer within our department. We have um, aerospace operations, professional flight officer, and air traffic collegiate training initiative. We just call it ATC. Those three are going to be under our aviation and aerospace science bachelors. Um, so those are our concentrations under our aviation and aerospace science bachelor's degree. We also offer a BS in aviation and aerospace management, um, and that will, you know, go into the management of um, airports or anything else. If you're more business oriented, we got you covered. Um, we also have a couple individualized degree programs, and those are kind of hard to put um, a label on them. You're basically going to talk to uh, the chair of our department, and we're going to guide you through um, a, a degree program that basically you choose for yourself. So if you if you don't see um, anything within our other degrees that kind of fit exactly what you want to do, we have an individualized degree program available for you, and they're very they're very powerful um, degrees, and we mostly specialize. For our IDPs, our individualized degree programs, we have um, a BS in aerospace systems engineering technology, we call it ASET, um, a BS in aerospace physics, and if you want to get an IDP, we also offer an IDP minor in space commercialization. Now, if you want to, uh, go, to go to a different department and just get a minor with us, we uh, have a minor in aviation technology, aviation management. Again, that's more the kind of tech side and the more business side for your minors. We also have certificates available for those students who just want to get in. They want to 
know what they need to know and get straight to their career path without the four-year degree. And that's perfectly acceptable. And we have the airport management certificate, the space commercialization certificate, spacecraft flight operation certificate, and the unmanned aerial systems certificate. Um, so that's everything we offer academically. And, uh, you know, we're here for your questions, comments, concerns, anything like that. If you want to see our whole comprehensive curriculum guide, I have the link below. It's basically msudenver.edu slash aviation and aerospace. And you can see our whole 40 page guide of what we have going on in our program. And I also, uh, I don't want to miss mentioning our wonderful clubs on campus. As you can see, I have pictures for the MSU Denver Precision Flight Team, as well as the aerobatics team. Um, they, they do competitions, they practice together, and they're just an all around great way to be a part of the MSU Denver Aviation and Aerospace Science community. We also, that I unfortunately don't have listed, but they're very, very powerful clubs on campus. We have the Women in Aviation Student Chapter, um, and they do a lot of outreach to, you know, high schools, middle schools. They, um, they do events on campus, and it's a really great group to be a part of. Um, we also have the AAAE which is a more business oriented um, uh, student group. And they, you know, they do outreach as well. They work with uh, professionals in the industry. And it's, again, it's just a great way for students to feel connected to other students who are interested in what they're interested in. And uh, they can feel like a part of the MSU Denver Aviation and Aerospace Science community. So if you have any questions with that, please reach out to um, the MSU Denver Aviation and Aerospace Science Department. You can find our contact information at the, the link provided. Um, and that's all I have to say for that. Thank you so much for your, for your time. And Dr. Emily Matula, I'll give it back to you. Thank you so much, Stephanie. I wish that I could be a part of the aerobatics club. That sounds like so much fun. So now we will hear from a panelist of experts ranging from commercial aviation and passenger logistics to drone inspections and supply chain management. At the end of this session, we will have a question answer session for all the panel members. So please reserve your questions until then. So the first session that we will be having is on aviation and aerospace industry career paths. So the aerospace industry encompasses a cradle to grave approach for aircraft, rockets, missiles, spacecrafts, and satellites. This includes the research, design, and manufacture of vehicles. The aerospace industry also includes maintenance of these vehicles to increase their longevity and su supports operations. The aviation industry is the global transportation network that carries goods and passengers by air. While air travel was only made possible in the early 20th century, the aviation industry now generates billions of dollars in annual revenue. It also provides essential services to numerous other industries, from medicine to national defense to tourism and sports. The bulk of the worldwide aviation industry is involved with the use and manufacture of airplanes. So we'll have two speakers within this session. Our first speaker is Dr. James Riley. He is an American geologist and former NASA astronaut and honorary U United States Marshal and is currently at the University of Alabama. He flew on three space shuttle missions, STS-89, STS-104, STS-117. Dr. Riley served as the 17th Director of the United States Geology Survey, Geological Survey from 2018 to 2021. He has three degrees from the University of Texas at Dallas, a Bachelor's of Science, Master's, and Doctorate degree in Geosciences. Dr. Riley was also selected to participate in the 1977 to 1978 Scientific Expedition to Marie Birdland, West Antarctica, as a research scientist specializing in stable isotope uh, geochronology. In 1979, he started his work as an exploration geologist with the Santa Fe Minerals Incorporated in Dallas, Texas. From 1980 to the time he was selected as in the astronaut program, Dr. Riley was employed as an oil and gas exploration geologist for InSearch Exploration, Inc. 
in Dallas, Texas. And rising to the position of chief geologist of the offshore region. NASA selected Dr. Riley for the astronaut program December 1994. Concurrent with his crew assignment, he was designated as payloads and procedures operation lead for the astronaut office ISS branch. Our second speaker in this section is Dr. Is, um, Joel Bruley. He began his aviation career as a pilot, flight instructor, airline dispatcher, and systems operation control manager before moving to Boeing 26 years ago to pursue many airline supplier endeavors associated with airline and military optimization support and training. For the past five years, Joel has been the product manager for Boeing's early career training solutions, which encompasses all physical and software learning solutions for the training of pilots, maintenance technicians, and dispatchers from zero time through airline ready. Joel has been an active FAA designated aircraft dispatch examiner for over 18 years. In addition to aviation, Joel holds an MBA and certifications in many business related disciplines. So with that, I would like to introduce Dr. James Riley as our first speaker in this panel. Great. Thanks, Emily. And I'm gonna share a screen here just to show a few slides as we work our way through. And uh, I wanna just mention that, um, as Emily mentioned, my background is really a scientist um, more than anything else in terms of, of um, where, uh, where I've come from. Um, so um, I'm going to um, give you an introduction to the aerospace or the space side of the aerospace industry here, because what I did was, was essentially part of the team that opened up the environment that uh, from an exploration standpoint that within our lifetimes, we're going to see used for transportation and whether it's uh, freight initially, which is very similar to how aviation began in the beginning of the 20th century, or whether it's uh, hauling people, which will be falling up uh, shortly after we start hauling freight into low earth orbit. And some of that, as you already know, is happening today. So SpaceX is uh, already launching uh, crews to the International Space Station. We've got Virgin Galactic that is going to start flying a suborbital flights. And if you've been tracking the news, Jeff Bezos is going to fly on the New Shepard uh, here within the next couple of months as one of the first passengers on, on his spacecraft. And so we're going to start seeing what is becoming an adventure um, for the average everyday uh, individual uh, has to be kind of a rich individual at this point. But within our lifetimes, it's going to be essentially the same as you and I getting on Southwest or United uh, tomorrow and being anywhere in the planet within 24 hours, which was a tagline of Boeing back uh, when they were flying the 747s. And uh, it's a great one. In 24 hours, you can be anywhere. But I want to just give you an idea of what it was like. There's my three space shuttle crews. Uh, notice there's not a lot of us. Uh, seven, five, and seven uh, people all together. And that was uh, designed to operate the space shuttle, which was designed in the 1970s to do three things. It was a launch vehicle, there was a spacecraft, and then it was basically an aircraft when we brought it home. So it had three very unique roles and three um, roles that were often in competition. But here's what I'd like to leave. And so I'm gonna run this little video uh, here so you can get an idea of Atlantis is really the past. So, we don't have a gate to push away from, except for those uh, engines that you see on the back of it, so it's a little bit different. We're also laying on our backs prior to departure. The engine starts six seconds before launch, and then the solid rocket boosters launch, and it's like somebody kicking the back of your chair as hard as they can, and we're off. And even though it doesn't look like we're going very fast here at the roll program, we're already doing over 200 miles an hour. And as you can hear in the background, it's a pretty busy time. There's a lot of communications inside the cockpit as well as with the launch control and mission control back in Houston. We're about right at one minute, we're gonna go supersonic. That's going straight up. And there you see the shock waves forming underneath the belly of Atlantis right there between the belly and the external tank. And you see there's the external view. And at uh, two minutes and 17 seconds, we'll be doing about five times the speed of sound. We're up at about uh, 120,000 feet. We kick off those uh, solid rocket boosters, and then we spend the next six and a half minutes to orbit, uh, running the three main engines you see on the back of the orbiter, burning the hydrogen and oxygen out of that big external tank. 
and now we're a spacecraft. And so about eight and a half minutes from launch, about the same time it takes for you to hear the double ding in the cockpit or in the uh, cabin of the commercial airliner uh, at uh, crossing through 10,000 feet, we're up about 212 miles, roughly about uh, 1.2 million feet, doing uh, about uh, 25 times the speed of sound or about five miles every second, 17,500 miles an hour, which is a nice way to travel. And then you're in space and uh, we get around the planet about 92 minutes. Uh, and so you see one of those sunsets that you see there uh, and a sunrise every 45 minutes, one or the other. And so the light going out and then the light coming back uh, doesn't denote a day. It's just a time you turn on your lights. And the other thing that we contend with is dealing with the weightless environment. And now everything's a little bit different in space. And that's what you see going on right here. You float everywhere. And it's actually a little disconcerting the first time you do it, but you get used to it pretty fast and then off you go. And uh, what you see in the inside of the shuttle here is all of our freight. So we were already a freighter even before uh, that was even considered uh, as a role in space. Uh, and it's a team effort as, uh, as folks will tell you, Emily can certainly tell you as well, since she's training the EVA people now, this is what I did. I was the spacewalker that you see in the upper left. Uh, we train in the water. We do this about seven times for every EVA that we do. So it's about 56 hours for each of the EVAs that uh, we operated on. They run about seven to eight hours uh, outside the spacecraft. And as you can see in that upper left, the uh, earth is upside down to what you would see here. But that's normal to us uh, because we're now in a weightless environment. Wherever my head is pointed is up and my feet are down. So up is towards the earth in this case, instead of the way we would normally put it here on the ground. Uh, this is what we did. We put the solar panels on my last mission. That's what you see on the left in the ISS at the upper left there. Uh, and that began what became the spacecraft all together. And that's what it looks like doing an EVA outside, as you can see down in the lower left. And that's what a, the ISS looks like today. It's over a million pounds mass, largest spacecraft we ever put in orbit. And it's a research station in orbit. In fact, it's designated the ISS National Lab today. Uh, because that's what it's designed to do, is be uh, a critical resource in terms of looking at the fundamental, uh, the fundamental sciences and applications that will change the way we do things here on Earth. And we just do it because we can operate in an area where there's no acceleration. The big G in an equation, the acceleration due to gravity, allows us to look at things in greater detail, grow things without them collapsing. Uh, soft crystals, for example, like insulin crystals, we can grow as large as we want to so that we can examine the structure that we can't do here. Now, at time to come home, we just turn into another aircraft, uh, and but it's a hypersonic aircraft. We hit the upper atmosphere doing uh, 25 times the speed of sound along those leading edges you see on the wings there that are in gray. Um, the one right closest to the fuselage before it moves forward, that uh, hits almost uh, 2,800 degrees Fahrenheit. And so we're really literally flying inside the head of a comet. This is what it looks like as we roll out on final approach to the runway there at Kennedy Space Center. And we're coming down about six times steeper than a commercial airliner at this point. And uh, what you see here is us coming down in, in that uh, 18 degree glide slope. And when we get to about, uh, as you'll see, as we're coming up about uh, 2,000 feet from the ground, we'll pull the nose up at 1,500 feet. And we start aiming for that uh, runway there that's three miles long out in front of you. We're doing 310 knots, as you see in the HUD there on the left. We come across the fence a little bit faster than a 747 or an A380. Touch down about 185 knots, uh, pretty much like a conventional airplane at this point. Pop a drag chute, and then we get uh, to missions complete when we announce we'll stop. And on my last mission, that was 220 orbits. So I picked up about 5.8 million miles. I have about 18 million miles total to my credit. Unfortunately, not a single one of them is a frequent flyer mile, uh, so I don't get any credit. Now, here's the challenge for the future. Space is everywhere uh, now. When I was growing up as a kid, we didn't have it. Uh, space didn't really exist other than as, as sort of this adventure for the first humans going into space. Uh, a few military and intelligence applications, but that was about it. Uh, but space is now everywhere in our lives, uh, as you all know. And this is the challenge that we're going to face uh, or we're delivering for uh, the students for today. We are looking at taking folks back to the moon with this vehicle right here. It's called the Space Launch System. It's going to be the largest rocket the United States has ever built. It's larger than the Saturn V. 
it'll put payloads into orbit that'll take us back to the moon and onto Mars. And that's where we want to go. And that's what you see right here. Uh, as um, Emily mentioned, I'm working with the University of Alabama and a number of other institutions. And we're looking at what can we do about building a habitat on the surface of the moon or using the surface of the moon resources there to build spacecraft in orbit rather than building them on the ground and launching them from the earth, which is the expensive part. So the technologies that we're examining today are different than anything we've ever done before. Uh, and we're going to go back to the moon, put a permanent research station, just like we have in the Antarctic, for example, after the heroic age of exploration back in the beginning of the 20th century. Same thing for the moon. We're going to do that in the 21st century. And we're going to um, start looking at what can we do there uh, and then where are we going to go. Now, the end result is we're going to do that with government uh, programs. But shortly after that, if you go to work as a FedEx pilot here in the next few years, you're very likely to finish your career um, similar to uh, Captain Willie's. After uh, several decades of working for FedEx, you may be flying your routes to the surface of the moon and back. Now, ultimately, we want to go and put humans on Mars. Um, but how do we plan to get there? It's a really difficult place to get to, difficult place to, to work. We're going to have to understand it better. We're going to have to use in situ resources, which means everything on the surface and under the surface are going to be the things that we use to, to live and work on the surface of Mars. And so we have to understand technologies in a better way. So with that, I want to thank you very much uh, for the, your, the opportunity to uh, chat with you about the aerospace side of the careers today. And uh, um, with that, I'll pass it back to Emily. And I want to thank uh, uh, Dr. Ivy and uh, Captain uh, Willie that uh, allowed me to be with you today. It's been my pleasure and I look forward to having an opportunity to answer questions later. Thanks very much. And I can only imagine that the pictures and videos just don't do it justice. Um, thank you for sharing that with us today. That's uh, very, very exciting. And with that, I would like to pass it off to uh, Joe Bruley. Uh, who will talk about uh, being a director and product manager at Boeing. Thank you, Emily. Uh, fascinating, Dr. Riley. Thank you very much. That was uh, excellent. I'm going to bring it down from the couple million mile elevation down to flight level 600 and below, 60,000 feet, and talk about uh, the Boeing technical or pilot and technician outlook. Uh, the Boeing has been cre creating the Technician Outlook for over 11 years now. Um, we're in the process of updating it for COVID. I can give you a few updates, and that final uh, updating for COVID will adjust the numbers for the next 20 years uh, and provide you with some statistics. Because right now, the, you know, the news in the industry doesn't provide the best, doesn't paint the best picture in terms of hiring. So I want to try to encourage you to, to keep an optimistic view, because Boeing definitely has an optimistic view on the need for uh, pilots and technicians, as well as cabin crew, and as well as a myriad of other fascinating aviation career choices. Um, and so uh, the technician outlook really provides a lot of capability there to, and you can just look at that in a few weeks right before Oshkosh, hopefully. We'll be down at Oshkosh if anybody else is. Please come into the Boeing Pavilion if you're in there uh, and, and look me up. But uh, we will update this hopefully just before Oshkosh. And um, what what you'll see here is, um, then basically it's uh, resilience. This slide is just intended to, to talk over the resilience, right? So if you look back over the past few decades, we can see a number of downturns that have occurred and the industry has always recovered and continued to grow. So while the airlines are right now in a cash conservation mode, um, we will see this trend reverse as the traffic uh, demand returns. With COVID, we're, seeing, we're estimating traffic to demand to return to 2019 levels in about three years. And so that's something to, to really think about in terms of positioning yourself now. Um, in a few more years, we'll return to long-term airline growth profitability, as well as uh, earlier than that, um, uh, cargo and other uh, aspects of commercial and other aspects of, of aviation. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. And in addition to the resiliency that, that aviation has, it's also um, hiring rebound. Uh, on the left-hand side, this chart will show the pilot hiring trends of the major U.S. airlines dating back to 1990. And you can see that the following industry trends recovering from late, uh, you know, following the, the industry recovery from 9-11, the pilot hiring rebound 
strongly until we hit the global financial crisis. And that hiring was a bit slower to recover from that crisis because mainly because as Willie and other, many others on this call can attest, that was right at the time where in 2007, we increased the retirement age from 60 to 65, which increased uh, that, which curbed the rebound in terms of hiring standpoint. But all factors aside, um, really now you're gonna see this uh, starting to rebound uh, very soon in the next three to four years. In addition to the chart on the right, also shows the similar surge in retirements for aviation maintenance technicians over the next one to, th uh, one, one to three years. And basically the, these two charts combined uh, are showing that a significant number of specialists are leaving the workforce and that will need to be replaced by everybody watching this, this webinar. So I encourage you. So even though it seems like we're laying off what seems like weekly job announcements, uh, the, the rebound is in the near future and we believe that. Uh, next slide, please. As far as the PTO forecast, which uh, you can get updates by way of just Googling or any major search engine, um, the pi Boeing Pilot and Technician Outlook. Uh, and that will uh, up, this will be updated in a few weeks for the new numbers. Uh, these are have been adjusted from last year's published numbers of 2020, which basically shows that 2.4 million jobs, pilots, technician, and cabin crew over the next 20 years are going to be needed, with two, with two million of those jobs in commercial aviation. Um, and so you can see the breakdown per region on this chart here, with the dark blue being pilots, the technicians in medium blue, and then the light uh, light blue being the cabin crew. And then looking at North American only, you can roughly see that 200,000 pilots and technicians uh, jobs over the next 19 years are going to be needed. Um, and that's in addition to every other genre or every other region that you could work in in the world. Um, and this is significant, is significant, but it is an overall decline of roughly about 3% as compared to last year's forecast uh, to pull it down and adjust for COVID and the impacts of COVID because there's, there is going to continue being a mixture of fleet to smaller uh, fuselage aircraft in the future and different uh, adjustments from COVID through the supply chain that we're going to, to see. Um, but it, it is, you know, look at this at your leisure and just to get some inferences associated with how many jobs are really associated with this. If you could go to the next slide. Um, what we stumbled across on just uh, just a, know, a week and a half, two weeks ago, was an article by Flying Magazine. And they did a, a re-spit out of the Bureau of Labor and Statistics handbook showing that in 2020, the median annual wage for pilots was $160,000, which is nearly four times the median wage for all U.S. workers who earned on average $41,000. Um, so, you know, sometimes you get the negative press hitting on the fact that pilots don't make that much and there's really not that many jobs. I want to encourage you, implore you to think about, look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics actual results of the average job pay. Um, the next slide, please. In addition to pilot wages, um, there are many other uh, career choices. Um, you know, the obvious careers are the air traffic controllers, the engineering, uh, performance engineering and other engineering, aviation management, uh, dispatch and other airline operations control positions, load planning, airport planning and design, aviation suppliers like Jefferson Boeing and other air, air, avionics manufacturers, uh, just a whole host of different places that you can go with uh, having a technical background in aviation. Um, and, and really more broadly, any job that you can think of that has a, has a, has a parallel in aviation, environmental sciences, aviation law, uh, even rocket scientists. I literally know uh, a friend of mine is a, uh, a Boeing performance engineer, and he literally has a doctorate in turbulence. I mean, you can get so deep in so many subjects. It's incredibly fascinating, and there's so many choices to pick from. It's, it's uh, really sometimes shorted by just specific, particular subject groups, and, but think about it, if there's so many applications in aviation, if aviation enthuses you, you can go so many different places with it, like law and everything else. Next slide, please. In addition to the Boeing uh, or the Bureau of Labor and Statistics uh, wages for pilots, on the next slide, you'll see the aerospace engineering wages, which is in the median annual wage for aerospace engineers over $200,000 uh, uh, higher than other engineers. Um, and so, which is just interesting, right? At, at $160,000, uh, 120000 median income. median income. Next slide, please. As another example, the air, air traffic control uh, jobs uh, uh, reported out from the Bureau of Labor Statistics have their annual uh, job is $130,000 over you know, all occupations looking at transportation industry, 41 again. 
Um, so if you could go to the next slide, uh, you know, the summary is that in, we do expect a rebound. Aviation has entered um, the external shocks before, or, or encountered external shocks before, and it has always recovered because of the fundamentals driving air traffic control remain strong. The people are still going to want to travel for business and go visit family and friends around the world. And, and as once this virus gets under control, easing travel restrictions, restoring passenger confidence, so will the jobs. Uh, recruitment is going to be remain just critically important to crews, uh, to airlines, um, even more important than in the, during the downturn. Uh, there's still a lot of unknowns that could impact timeline for the recovery. But one thing we do know is that the people will continue to retire and, and the age of the workforce is, is going to require replacement. So in the near term, it's important to continue building that pipeline to support attrition replacement. And over the longer term, the demand for new personnel will come from a con combination of attrition replacement as, as the well as the fleet growth, right? In terms of fascinating careers, right, sky's the limit. You can go any place and everywhere with it. I look forward to answering any questions you might have. Uh, position now. <laughs> the, the, now is your time to position yourself for the future. Sky's the limit. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, I, I definitely understand how uh, we will be rebounding, and, and I 100% uh, get behind that as well. So uh, let's go ahead and move on to our next section, which is the airline industry career paths. So the terms airline industry and aviation industry are sometimes thought of being synonymous, but in reality, they have different meanings. The aviation industry includes all aviation related businesses, including aircraft manufacturers, companies offering non-commercial flights, aerospace companies, regulation authorities, and those involved with research. Whereas the airline industry refers to companies that offer air transportation services to paying customers, including cargo and passengers. With this in mind, the airline industry can be classed as just one sector of the wider aviation industry. The two speakers that are a part of this section are Captain Rob Biddle. Captain Rob Biddle is the first black chief pilot for United assigned to the airline's hub in Colorado. His aviation career is extensive, including chief pilot and director of flight operations in Denver and assistant chief pilot flight manager, Chicago, 737 flight instructor and type B examiner. He's had over 27 years at United. Captain Biddle is also the founder and president of the nonprofit organization ProFlight Futures. ProFlight Futures supports high school students' dreams of flying through PFF career seminars, providing robust resources and coordinating mentorship and scholarship opportunities. Second, I would like to introduce Bruce Atlas. Bruce Atlas is the Chief Operating Officer at the Ontario International Airport Authority where he oversees the airport's day-to-day -day operations. Bruce has worked for Southwest Airlines from 1988, or sorry, 1998 to August 2016, where most recently as Southwest uh, Ontario Station Manager for the past 12 years. Prior to that, he was the Deputy Station Manager for Southwest at Los Angeles International Airport. And during this period, the station was highly awarded, including winning the company's Station of the Year top performing station and other honors. Bruce's expertise includes airport station management, ground handling, administration, security safety operations, infrastructure management, and customer service. So I'd like to first introduce and welcome Captain Rob Biddle. Hey, good evening. Uh, first, I'd like to start off by thanking Dr. Ivory and Captain Daniels for the opportunity to join this webinar. I'm really excited about the opportunity to share a little bit about an important and exciting program at United, United Airlines called Aviate. Before I begin, though, I'd like to share with you a little, th a little bit about myself. You know, as you get into a career to be an airline pilot, there's two traditional paths. The first path is through the military, and the second is through civilian aviation. I chose the latter of the two. Uh, when I was in, after my senior year in high school, I took an introductory flight in Minneapolis, Minnesota, uh, and immediately I was just blown away about the opportunity to fly airplanes for a living. So I scrapped my plans to be an orthopedic surgeon and I decided to be a pilot. Uh, I quickly moved through all my flight instructor ratings and became a flight instructor while I was in college. 
Once I graduated from college, I went to work for a regional airline and became a captain there before advancing to United. Now, we can talk a little bit more about the military career, military pathways as well, but the Aviate program is something that's very important for our sourcing of pilots for the future. Um, and we're really excited to share that. So uh, next slide, please. So as, as our colleague just mentioned uh, about the projected re retirements in the years ahead, you can see our retirement curve at United Airlines. We retire 5,000 pilots in the next 10 years. Not only that, we expect to grow significantly in our, in our organization. We intend to be the largest airline in the world. As you can see, as the years go by, uh, due to COVID, we had some early retirements. So in the next few years, we'll have a, a modest amount of retirements in, in two to 300. But then five years from now, we'll be going north of 500 retirements for seven years straight. Um, our current pilot headcount is, is 12,800 pilots, and we intend to get to 16,000 pilots. Next slide. And you can see with the animation there that you can see that there's uh, uh, those peaks, those high peaks that will have our retirements. Now, Aviate is a program that is brand new. We launched it just a few months ago. It's an industry leading program to source pilots as early as, as junior high and working all the way through becoming a United pilot. Um, again, we're gonna hire over 10,000 pilots in 10 years. And an important part of AD8 is that not everybody has an airline captain living next door and somebody to mentor and guide them. So anybody who's interested and gets accepted into the AD8 program will have one of our United pilots directly assigned to them as a mentor and to help them make decisions and answer questions and be a resource for them uh, through the years as they advance toward a United cockpit. It's important that we understand that we really closely align ourselves with business partners and folks that are, are um, uh, focused on um, helping you get to your goal. We have partnerships from youth organizations to flight schools to part 135 operators and more. Next slide. So Aviate is a clear path to United Airlines. It gives you a clear path it, it has you join the United family very early in career. Uh, you get clarity every step of the way, so there's no surprises. And if, you, if somebody's selected for Aviate, they are guaranteed a job at United Airlines, assuming they follow all, the, all of the coursework that we do and maintain as a good, and good student and employee. Next slide. All right, so here's the meat and potatoes. So this is the Aviate program flowchart. So we have diversity recruitment programs, uh, many of those. Then we also have a, a partnership with youth aviation programs, EAA, for, for instance. And then once you graduate high school and go to, and go to college, uh, there's a couple pathways to get your flight training. We have an academy in just north of Phoenix, Arizona, called the AVA Academy. And that's a flight school that has um, uh, aircraft that'll take you all the way from a student pilot all the way to a commercial pilot and a flight instructor. Well, we also have training partners. If, if you don't wanna to go to Phoenix to do your flying, we have training partners that are in different colleges and also different flight schools across the country. As you go, as you, after you complete your training, we have partners with um, organizations and airlines and air companies that you can build your experience. Working your way to the next step is being a, a first officer and then a captain at one of our express partners. And we have five express partners that we associate with. After a couple of years at Express and, and we continue to need pilots at Mainline, you will pass on to United Mainline as a first officer in one of our big jets. Now, the really cool thing about this is that once you interview and are accepted into Aviate, you won't interview ever again in your career. You are a United pilot at the beginning of the time, so much so that we're going to, if you're accepted into Aviate, even out of high school, you'll get travel privileges and many benefits that our, our current employees enjoy. Next page. Okay, here's some, of our, here's some of our business partners. So in the youth program, so folks who are, are under the age of 18 or so can join the EEA program. Then we have select universities that we have partnerships with. I know there's some names that you recognize and there's some others that are from HBCU universities just to make sure that we, we create a great diverse background of our pilots here at United. 
we have flight schools. I mentioned the Aviate Academy, but we also have uh, nation, national wide aviation schools like ATP and US Aviation. Then we mentioned earlier about the business partners where you can gain your experience. So once you're done uh, becoming a flight instructor or getting your commercial pilot's license, you could choose to A, uh, main, stay at those schools and continue on as an instructor there to build your hours, or B, you could go to a Meriflight or Boutique Air who will give you opportunities in the 135 environment to fly those airplanes to build your experience before you move on to Air Wisconsin, Commute Air, Mesa, and GoJet. As you can see across the bottom of the slide, uh, back, back to please, and thank you. Across the bottom of the slide, we have great relationships, special relations with many diverse organizations from Women's Aviation, FAST, NGPA, OBAP, and more. So I encourage you to explore those um, great organizations to get involved with, and also uh, Captain Daniels uh, uh, Shades of Blue. Next slide. Okay, so United is well known for our commitment to diversity. And it's important to understand that it, it, we want our cockpits to look like the communities that we serve. Currently, United has the most diverse pilot group in, of any major US carrier with nearly 20% of our pilots who are either women or people of color. We intend to increase that significantly. And we have these programs set into place to make sure that we really try hard to maintain our diverse population because our diversity is one of our greatest strengths. Uh, we're raising, we're going to raise that number and we're planning to help do that. You remember the Aviation Academy I mentioned that's in the north part of Phoenix. We are planning to have half of those graduates over the next 10 years be women or people of color. That's the true commitment to United Airlines. So if you think over the next 10 years, at least one quarter of our pilots that are coming on to United will be women or, or people of color. Next page. Okay, you might be wondering, hey, well, how do I do this, Rob? Well, Aviate's program is get you to get you tonight's cockpit in five steps. You meet the eligibility requirements, you apply and significant and successfully interview. And there's three different, there's three different evaluations that happen before you're given the opportunity to join the program. It's a very competitive process, and we're interested in the best of the best, and we won't settle for anything less. So we really want top top contenders, bright hardworking folks uh, who care about people to join our, our organization. Step number three is you build flight experience in hours, then you fly to regional partners and you transition seamlessly at United Airlines. Next page. So there's a QR code if you wanna get your cell phones out and take a peek, or you can go to un aviate at united.com and hit us up on Instagram. And it's got all the information there. And it's a really great and functional website. You can find out exactly where you are, like you're a high school student, you're a currently a flight instructor somewhere, and any other any other background, and it will guide you into the next steps to join ABA. Um, really excited to share this with you. I'm going to stick around at the end of the end of the uh, presentations. Be happy to answer any questions. Then, thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Captain Brew. Uh, let's go ahead and move on to Bruce Atlas. Well, thank you very much. And thank you, uh, Dr. Ivy, um, University of Arizona Global Campus, uh, Metropolitan State University of Denver, and of course, my dear friend, uh, Captain Willie Daniels. Thank you for this opportunity to be with you on today. Um, Captain Rob Riddle gave you the meat and potatoes so let me uh, let me share with you what the dessert is like uh, being in the uh, airline industry. Uh, I started with Southwest Airlines in 1998 and spent a couple of decades with Southwest. Uh, but if you didn't know, the very first day that you sign on with the airline, you have flight benefits. What does that mean? Uh, you fly free, your parents fly free, and your children fly free. And your, your children, if you retire with the, with the airlines, you have flight benefits for the rest of your life, you and your spouse. Your children, of course, have benefits until um, age 18, or if they attend college or university, they have benefits until uh, age 23, uh, 24, depending on the airline that you fly with. And that is a great 
uh, benefit to be able to uh, fly the world. We, we can fly on any airline. The airline that you're employed with, you, it doesn't cost you anything. It's free travel. And you, if you fly on other airlines outside of your company, you may have to pay the taxes. What a wonderful benefit. What a wonderful uh, opportunity to, to see the world. Well, as chief operating officer here at the Ontario International Airport Authority, uh, my job encompasses the day-to-day -day operation. What does that look like? Uh, what does it take to operate and, and maintain an airport? Well, just about every skill, every job uh, opportunity that you heard on this presentation today is covered here at the, at the airport with the airport authority. So my responsibility is uh, airfield operations, land side operations, uh, safety and security. In the safety and security realm, for security, we have law enforcement officers, we have security officers, we have traffic officers that maintain uh, the uh, security of the airport to prevent uh, any outside or uh, individuals coming onto a secured area to make sure that the safety of the employees and the traveling public is there. Uh, on the uh, land side operation, uh, there's a tremendous amount of jobs. As you heard earlier in, from our earlier uh, presenters, uh, but on the land side, uh, we have planners uh, that help to plan out the airport, that, that uh, let, prepare the airport layout plan for the FAA for uh, potential growth opportunities. We have environmentalists that uh, when you're looking at greenfields and brownfields, you have to do environmental studies to make sure that everything is safe to build on. Um, when we talk about uh, land site opportunities, uh, we have the parking garages or our parking structures where people are employed uh, to manage the, the parking for our customers and our guests. The, uh, on the fire side, we have engineers, uh, uh, as far as ARF is concerned, aircraft rescue and firefighting. So we have firemen at the airport. There's, there's the same opportunities that you have at any city are available at the airport. And those jobs consist of um, engineers, electricians. We have plumbers at the airport um, to make sure that things are, are, are squared away for you when you fly. We, we have uh, carpenters at the airport, um, heavy equipment uh, mechanics, light equipment uh, uh, mechanics. We, we have uh, locksmiths at the airport. Uh, so just about anything that you can think of, any opportunity that may interest you, it's available at the airport. Signs, we, we have individuals that make signs. Uh, landscaping, we have painters. Uh, of course, when you walk into terminals in the summer, you want the air condition working. So we have uh, HVAC, uh, uh, air condition uh, and refrigeration. Um, administration staff. Uh, within our office, um, with the chief executive officer, I have a, a deputy uh, executive officer, we have a chief commercial officer, we have a chief planning. Uh, we, there's so many opportunities at any level from uh, management to uh, field operations. We have utility crews that ensure when we have incidents that they come out and set up the uh, command post uh, with, and provide uh, cover from the elements with, with pop-ups and chairs and water, uh, ice, to, to make sure that the, the command is ran. We have uh, also uh, under the um, safety and security, we have uh, an emergency manager that is make sure that the airport is prepared for all of our part 139 drills, we are required by the FAA to, to do a, a drill every year, a tabletop exercise, and then every three years we're required to have a full scale exercise. So think of all the things that go into um, you know, running an airport or being employed by an airport or an airline. Uh, most of your experience is from the curb to the cabin. So you may encounter the, the sky caps at the, at the counter. You, you may encounter the ticket counter agents. 
the encounter the gate agent, the TSA, and, and as the wonderful pilots uh, that have presented here today, talked about, think about all of the various professions that require um, pilots. Uh, the FBI uh, hires pilots for their organization, the TSA. So there's a tremendous need for uh, people and employees in the aviation industry. And as you've heard some of the numbers, those jobs uh, continue to be available. Uh, look at what just happened with the, uh, with the, the situation with COVID. And now uh, customers or passengers are returning back to the skyways a lot faster um, than we thought that they would. And so we're, every, every airline is ramping up to be uh, prepared for the return of people uh, flying and, and taking trips and, and going to see loved ones now that things are winding down with, with COVID. So there's plenty of opportunities today, you know, if you have interest in aviation, just about any career that you can think of, whatever your mind is fixed on today, as far as your uh, field of concentration, there's, uh, I can guarantee you that there is a career in aviation uh, in that whatever field that you go into. So I strongly encourage you to get involved. Me having the opportunity at an early age to have my family fly around the country, that was afforded to me because of the airlines that I worked for. Being an inner city kid um, growing up in, in Watts, I, I never saw myself um, being involved in aviation. But once you get that aviation bug, once you catch that bug, you get infected with that uh, aviation bug, you get jet fuel in your system. Look at Captain Willie Daniels. He retired and he wasn't retired for two weeks and he's right back at it. And so that's because he has that aviation bug inside of him and it'll be with him for the rest of his life. So again, any questions that you may have, we'll be happy to answer those questions for you. This is a great career. It's a great opportunity, as mentioned earlier, as a pilot. Uh, it's an opportunity to have a career that pays over six figures for 40 plus years. That's a tremendous opportunity. That, that can create generational wealth. And so uh, don't hesitate. This is a wonderful career. Once you get in involved, you never get out. So thank you for your time and thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Bruce. I really appreciate that and your insight. Um, with that, we're going to go ahead and move on to drone aviation. So drone aviation, uh, in aviation and space, drones ref uh, refers to an unpiloted aircraft or spacecraft. Another term for it is unmanned aerial vehicle or UAV. Drones are being used to great effect in widely differing industries, including inspections in agriculture, uh, architecture, insurance and filmmaking while also having the capacity to provide deliveries for online shopping or even international humanitarian organizations. Adam Zare, who is going to be our next speaker, is the founder, chief executive officer and board chairman, an operational leader who has managed industrial projects ranging from 185 million to 850 million with teams up to 2,000 plus individuals. Adam was most recently the C senior PM for an $850 million mega project in Lake Charles, Louisiana. Adam started in the construction industry as a project controls manager responsible for analyzing and documenting construction progress, reporting, and performance, leading to early insights on the use of UAV technology in construction. Welcome, Adam. Thank you very much. I'm going to go ahead and uh, share this slide deck. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Perfect. Okay. So uh, I'm going to first, well, first of all, I'm Adam Zayer. I'm the CEO of Fly Guys. I'm going to go ahead and give a brief introduction of Fly Guys, and then I'm going to go into the evolution of drone technologies, applications within a few of the industries, and then talk about some some of the new job opportunities on the market that we'll be developing over the next decade. <clears throat> and I'll try to stick to my seven minutes. So uh, Fly Guys collect aerial data anywhere in the United States and in a number of countries worldwide for clients that need continuous data collection performed in multiple locations. 
as an example, let's say a company needs images of a thousand different cell phone towers in 30 different states, and the images need to be taken in the exact same way. Fly Guys would manage and ensure the correct collection of these images. We collect this data using both in-house and contractor pilots. We have over 4,000 contractor pilots in our database, and we have in-house project managers and a proprietary project manager platform that we use to manage and organize the collection of this data. We collect several different kinds of data sets, including RGB, infrared, multispectral, and LIDAR data sets. Uh, so a brief history of drones, the evolution of drones. So humans have been thinking about what we would call drones for a long time now. And like most techn technological advances, they got their start in the military. All the way back in the 1850s, history saw the first use of a predecessor to drones, namely military balloons with explosive payloads. However, these wouldn't fit into what we would now consider drones. For our purposes, I like to define it as unmanned flying systems controlled either remotely or operating autonomously. The first modern drones that meet this definition were deployed in the Vietnam War era and were used for dedicated reconnaissance. Uh, but these drones were very expensive and drone use was limited to the military. Eventually, Drones made it into the commercial markets, and we are now seeing a year-over-year -year growth of around 60% in the drone services market. There are three primary reasons that led to commercial adoption of drones. First, the innovations in hardware technology and hardware pricing. Um, you know, if drones were too expensive to purchase, the commercial markets wouldn't be able to support them. Second, the innovations in software, such as image stitching software and flight automation software. Without these two tools, commercial uses would be very limited. And the third thing, favorable FAA regulations, specifically the 107 certification. Just to give some background on this, when commercial use of drones was first hitting the market, it was required to receive what was then called a 333 exemption in order to fly commercially, uh, which required you to have a private pilot's license. This effectively capped the labor market to around 5,000 drone pilots nationwide. When the FAA released the 107 certification process, the number of drone pilots skyrocketed, allowing for more individuals to enter the market, which allowed for drone data to be collected effectively anywhere within the United States, and it also lowered the price point of that data to be collected. So we're now at a point where new applications are being developed on what seems like a monthly basis. The drone service industry is growing at 60% per year, and some analysts are predicting a market size of around 50 billion by 2027, and that's drone mer uh, drone services, uh, and that's a global number. Now I'm gonna go ahead and talk through some of these applications for different industries. A big industry uh, utilizing drones is the energy and utility industry. The ma the majority of these um, of these um, you know utilizations in the in this industry are for inspection and documentation purposes. So some of the major assets to be inspected for this industry are transmission and distribution lines and structures solar farms and wind farms. Um, so for transmission and distribution for utility companies, um, we inspect towers and it's becoming a very predominant um, method for documenting and inspecting these, these, these assets. The way this typically works is uh, as follows. So a team of pilots led by a project manager will inspect T&D assets in the field. The pilots will take pictures of each asset from certain angles that have been predetermined. Once the images have been taken, inspection specialists and engineers will evaluate, grade, and document the status of these assets. This process will eventually create work orders and statuses for each asset in the field. Uh, solar farms provide a unique opportunity to integrate drones into the mix, in particular thermal drones for new project commissioning. The way this works is you fly a drone with a thermal sensor over a solar farm, which will be able to take a temperature reading of the solar panels. Um, solar panels, that operate at uh, proper specifications will be within a certain external temperature. The drone data is then compared to these temperature specifications, and if there are any deviations between the data sets, then that indicates an issue. Um, so for wind farms, drones equipped with high-definition cameras and other sensors are used in wind farms to generate external pictures of the turbine's blades. These pictures are used to detect structural problems such as corrosion or hot spots that were not uh, previously observable to the naked eye. Another advantage of using drones and wind farm uh, inspection is that you can get to the same height as the, as the blades and capture and get up close and capture high definition data sets. Um, onto the 
construction industry. So progress monitoring of construction progress will be around for as long as construction progress are going around. Uh, progress monitoring uh, used to consist of sending project engineers to walk around the construction project and document by taking notes uh, the progress status of each portion of a construction project. This allows project managers to um, hold contractors accountable and compare estimated cost to actual cost. However, sending a bunch of uh, project engineers to document a construction site is time consume, consuming and costly. Using a drone, you're able to document the site in a fraction of the time and store this data forever. A team of project engineers can evaluate the site at a home office, which is safer and less expensive. Another application is precision agriculture. So precision agriculture's goal is to increase yield and control expenses through a variety of means. Drones can be used to capture images and data sets, which can be analyzed through different software platforms. The two main types of data sets used in precision agriculture are RGB, which is just normal uh, imagery, and multispectral, uh, which captures five different wavelengths in the electromagnetic band. Uh, deliverables inc include crop yield count, which allows you to estimate the size of your crop, plant stress analysis, which helps identify problems and stresses, um, and then weed analysis, which uh, allows you to, to identify um, weeds and uh, determine where you want to lay more herbicide. Another really neat um, idea that's going to become prevalent is the idea of a digital twin. Um, so in what it is, it's a term that Basically, a digital twin is a high, high accuracy, high resolution digital copy of an asset that exists in real life. So, for instance, if you own a tank farm that stores oil, you can create a digital twin of all your tanks and evaluate the data for cracks, rust, different colors, etc. You can then create a digital twin the next year and compare the two data sets to see what changes occurred over time. You can then create a maintenance plan of action based on these changes. Basically, the idea of a digital twin will be to document all of a company's assets to know the conditions of each asset and the life expectancy and maintenance costs and schedule for the foreseeable future. Uh, so on to jobs and opportunities. This industry is going to lead to a number of new jobs and opportunities that will come with these new applications and uh, growth in the market. And I've only just touched on the different applications within industries. Um, First and foremost, it's going to be drone pilot jobs. As these industries develop and new applications are discovered, the need for more and more drone pilots will continue to increase. Uh, you wouldn't make quite as much as being an airline pilot, so I just want to point that out. Uh, project management jobs. Whenever you have people in the field working, in this case drone pilots, you will need uh, management taking care of things behind the scene to make sure everything flows properly. A few things that a project manager is in charge of include coordinating with the client and pilot, scheduling and updating the schedule, checking the quality of the data, and handling any unknown or unforeseen issues that may arise. Software programmers with many of the new software platforms on the market, many more being developed. The job market for programmers within this industry is going to continue to increase. Data analysts. Drones will be collecting a ton of data over the next 10 years, and a lot of this data will be analyzed automatically with pre-built platforms, but there will be custom requests and problems where solutions have not been automated yet. This is where the data analyst comes in. They will pre preferably have a degree in computer science or statistics and be very familiar with programming. Lastly, entrepreneurs. This industry will go grow quickly, and much like the Internet, will lead to lots of innovation. The main driver in this industry will be people who see problems to be solved and try to solve them through creating new business opportunities. That's, that is fantastic. I'm so glad that you were able to join us and, and show us um, all the different ways that we could use drones uh, in today's industry. Um, with that, I will go ahead and uh, move on to our next section, which is uh, technology and aviation. So technology and aviation, whether through digital transformation, decarbonization, or autonomous operations, the bold nature of aviation is not slowing. Technology is central to the future of air transport industry. Automation is the aviation industry gaining momentum due to rapid advancements in the fields of robotics, artificial intelligence, biometrics, automation, cybersecurity, big data, and 5G technology. I'd like to introduce Les Berry, who is a Denver native, studied political science at the University of Colorado Boulder. However, he always had an interest in computers. Les 
has settled into a 26 year career with the city and county of Denver, working at Denver Auditor's Office in Denver International Airport. Les has served in many positions, including as a project manager and director of applications and infrastructure. He currently serves as the passenger processing product director overseeing the suite of applications and hardware used to facilitate the passenger journey through the airport. Les, you have the stage. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you to Dr. Ivy and to all of the panelists for the, um, the wonderful information which has been shared. Um, it, it's just an amazing, the variety of positions and opportunities that exist in the aviation industry. But I'm gonna focus on one which is near and dear to my heart and that's IT. And everyone needs IT. Accounting needs IT, planes need IT, email, mechanics use IT. Everyone uses IT, so you might as well be where the action is. In addition to that, the pay is great and it's a young person's position. So let me get started. So we're gonna start off with, um, I'm Les Berry, I'm the Passenger Processing Product Director at Denver International Airport. I am gonna start off with some fun facts or some bragging rights about DIA. Uh, the first is it's the seventh busiest airport in the world. It's also the third busiest airport in the United States. It hosts to 22 different commercial airlines. And those airlines include United Airlines, Southwest and Frontier dominate the market. American and Delta are a little further behind. And then there's a number of other airports, airlines that serve um, different markets, international markets or small city markets or whatnot. Um, we serve 201 different destinations, both national and international. We have 29,000 people at DIA. As uh, one of the speakers said earlier, it's like a small city where you've got everything that a city would have from a morgue to the fire department to police to all the different IT operations. And DIA is an economic generator. We're an economic engine for the Denver area, for the Denver metro area, and for the entire Rocky Mountain region to the tune of $33 billion on an annual basis with jobs and with contracts and uh, just other opportunities. We generate a lot of economics for the area. But let me get into IT. Um, there's some major components to the IT. There's applications, which in my analogy, it's the meat, it's the flesh of IT. There's infrastructure, which is the bones and the support system. There's cybersecurity, which is sort of the nose and mouth and lungs. There's customer service, which is the eyes and the ears. And then my favorite is passenger processing. It's the skin. It's the beautiful part of the operations and, and everyone wants to be part of the beauty um, side of things. So I will spend a little bit more time talking about that than the others, but they're all important and they're all interconnected. So let's start with um, some of the things that applications do, the meat and the flesh. We have Salesforce, which is the up and coming uh, platform for development. We do development for our customer service. We do custom, um, custom development for our parking operations and for a lot of different things. Um, Salesforce has become the go-to application that we use. Maximo is the application that's used by the uh, maintenance facility in order to keep track of the cars and the trucks and the snow, snow shovels and all of that kind of stuff. Viochi is one of the new up and coming applications for the security world. As was mentioned before, we have to do security checks on all 30,000 employees uh, that go in and out of DIA. There's security for the cameras and there's a slew of cameras, I would tell you, but then I'd have to kill you how many cameras there are and where they're located. But there's lots of cameras all over the place. ServiceNow is what we use to track how well we're doing. If you send in a request for a new computer or for a computer to get fixed, 
that's the what is put in as a ticket. And so we have SLA, service level agreements, on how quickly we have to get those resolved and service now is that application. So there's a lot of other applications that are used at an airport, but that's just a, a few of the, of the really big ones. Infrastructure. We have a slew of computer servers and storage arrays, and that is what's driving all of the applications. It's what's holding the data for the security folks, and many of our applications are looking at going into the cloud using Amazon Web Services, but we still have a significant uh, investment in the servers on campus. We run our own network. Um, once you get inside the 53 square miles of Denver International Airport, we run all of the copper and all of the fiber that gets data from point A to point B and point A to the edge of the um, edge of the property and then out to the internet. So it's a huge operation to run a network infrastructure. We run a Cisco environment. So if you're interested in IT, look at Cisco um, engineers. They're paid a lot of money. Um, we have our own voice system. We run an Avaya voice system um, and everything from the Avaya server to all of the desktops. Um, we also run the fastest, I will repeat that, the fastest Wi-Fi of any airport in North America. We have blazing Wi-Fi speeds and we're very proud of that and we brag about that. Um, cybersecurity. Uh, as people know, the cybersecurity has become more and more important uh, as we protect our assets from the bad guys. And the bad guys come from all over the world. We have bad guys penetrating, trying to penetrate us from, um, well, I won't say which countries, you know which ones they are there. Um, some are friendly and some are not. Um, we also have bad guys inside the United States trying to poke around. What we've done here is create a seven layers of security. And so there's a, a, a real um, difficult path in order to get through all seven layers. And then there's another seven layers to get out. So even if you get in, you can't get out um, at our system. And um, so we're really proud of protecting our desktops um, and providing um, security information, security training to our end users because the weakest link in most security setups are people who um, click on a link that they shouldn't be. So we do a lot of education. Um, any customer, any uh, IT department is going to have a customer service. We provide our users with cell phones for work environments. Um, we have our own radio system, which is used for police and fire and for operations and maintenance so that they can communicate as they move around the 53 square miles of, of DIA. And we provide desktop support. And these are just a few of the customer service uh, functions that we provide. Now we're gonna get into the skin, the things that really make an IT and an airport beautiful. And that's passenger processing. And this is my specialty, my baby. Um, Everyone's been to the airport and wondered what time their flight is going to arrive or land um, or depart. Um, these flight information displays, we take an aggregate of data from all the airlines and run them into a database and then display them in pretty format so that you know when you come to the airport what time the flight is supposed to depart or what time the flight is supposed to arrive. This is something we've been doing for many years and we do it quite well. Um, Common use, one of the things that we are finding is that we can't build enough terminal space. And so we're asking airlines to share counters. In order to share counters, they have to be able to share equipment. And we provide that common equipment so that this workstation can be British Airways in the morning and it can be JetBlue in the afternoon and need be, it could be um, another WestJet uh, at a different time. So we provide that common use uh, equipment that makes airlines and airports more efficient. We provide another common use uh, kiosk. So you can come up to this kiosk and press an icon for United or Southwest or any airline 
and it will take you into that airline system. And there you can print your boarding pass or your um, bag tag. And last but not least, the thing which we're most um, proud of is um, common use um, uh, bag drop units. Um, this is a new service that we'll be offering beginning in November. Um, just like other self-service options where you can get cash from your ATM or pump your own gas, this will allow passengers, you don't have to stand in line, you just come up to the self bag drop unit, you scan your boarding pass, you put your bag on and it takes it away. It's put, bringing self-service to um, an airport. And with that, I will turn it back to Emily. Thank you so much, Les. And I will like to say uh, firsthand experience, that is very fast internet. And I love traveling through DIA, uh, partially right. for that reason. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Perfect. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, change, change the focus just a little bit. Uh, so we have Dr. Moss next. And um, Dr. Moss is the public affairs specialist, uh, NASA Office of Communications um, out of Glenn Research Center in Col uh, Cleveland, Ohio. So Dr. Moss has been a member of the NASA family for 15 years as a leader within Cleveland, Ohio's Glenn Research Center Office of Communications. Uh, Dr. Moss has demonstrated his strong commitment for inspiring diverse populations by planning, developing, and leading public engagement events for underrepresented audiences. He attained his PhD in Urban Studies and Public Affairs from Cleveland State University in 2011. Through his scholarly dissertation, he examined leadership and generational diversity in the federal workforce. So welcome Dr. Moss and the floor is yours. Hello, hello. Thank you all for having me. Delighted and honored to be here. Thank you, Captain Willie Daniels and congratulations on um, your new assignment. Um, don't know if you'll ever actually get a chance to retire. Um, that's just how good you are, though. Also, Dr. Ivy, thank you for uh, allowing me to share a couple words here. Um, I'm so I was so excited to see uh, astronaut really give that great presentation. Oftentimes, when you say NASA and I show up at a school or a presentation, they think I'm an astronaut, and I have to be a Debbie Downer and say, "No, unfortunately, I'm not an astronaut." But with this audience, you all actually did hear from a wonderful astronaut, and he shared some great uh, photos, and his story was absolutely phenomenal. So thank you for teeing up my presentation with your presentation, because when people think of NASA, the first thing they think of is astronauts and going in, into outer space. And actually, uh, astronaut, really, he was correct. Um, he stated that NASA is going back to the moon and then ultimately to Mars. We are definitely excited to do that. We're shooting for 2024 for us to land back on the moon. And then from there, years down the line, we look forward to landing on Mars. And this whole project is something that we're very, very excited about. And it's called uh, the Artemis Project. So we're looking forward to that. At NASA, we are very, very excited to share this new mission and bring young folks along, as well as the general public, but particularly for students and young folks, we have labeled them as the Artemis generation. We know about our, our, our parents and some of our grandparents, they, they, they were part of the Apollo era, but now in 2020, it's a, a new emergence of fresh energy with this whole new Artemis program and also the Artemis generation. So with that in mind, in order for us to get to space, NASA has tons of career opportunities in areas such as operations, logistics, transportation, supply, and also fuel operations. I can't, I don't have enough time to break down all of that, but just give you an example of something that falls within the purview of operations or uh, logistics or supply management is fuel operations. So we actually order those who work in logistics or operations actually order the fuel for the rocket to blast off into outer space, which is called rocket fuel. So uh, logisticians, they order the supplies, they order vehicles, um, they implement programs and policies to reduce greenhouse gases and, and 
uh, better preserve the environment. So you don't need to have a pilot's license for this, but you may have other professional skills to help you do this job. For instance, you may have a uh, a bachelor's in business management. You may be like myself, my background or, or my master's degree is in public administration or public management. And we heard about it earlier, some of the skills you may need, you may need leadership skills, project management, project planning. Saying all that to say, you, you may love the aviation industry or aerospace industry, but you may not be as te technical savvy. You may not be um, a pilot. You may not be an engineer, but you still want to get some of that jet fuel in your system. As our, 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 our colleague uh, Bruce said earlier, there are tons of other support staff opportunities that you all can take advantage of that will help you get into the aviation and aerospace industry. I also want to hit on this, education opportunities and internships. So I do a lot of work with young people and young students, and that's one of the first pieces of, pieces of advice I share with them is that you have to take advantage of any education opportunity or internship opportunity that will give you exposure. NASA has 10 centers across the country, and we have tons of education opportunities and also internship experiences, and get this, a lot of the internship experiences and also education experiences are now virtual. So you can be anywhere in the world, literally, and still take advantage of some of NASA's offerings. So I encourage you all to go to nasa.gov or just Google NASA Education and Internship Opportunities, and you, you'll be amazed at how many opportunities that are uh, available to you should you have interest in taking advantage of them. I myself, I started as an intern when I was in graduate school, and then I ultimately was offered a full-time job. And um, I actually, when I first time I was offered a full-time job, can you believe I told NASA no? I told them I didn't want the job. The reason was because I actually wanted to further my education. That was, they offered me a full-time job when I was um, in master's, working on my master's. I was going part working at NASA part time, and then I decided to pursue my PhD. And so I say, NASA, if you can hold off for just four more years, let me get this PhD and put it in my back pocket. Then I'll come back and work for you all full time. And, and obviously, NASA was gracious enough to uh, allow me to work part time as an intern until I fulfilled my uh, requirements for the doctorate degree. But you want to take advantage of these types of, of opportunities in this competitive market. You want to do all you can to have a step ahead of the other competition that may be out there. Um, I'm a great example of me um, trying to be a step ahead and take advantage of these uh, types of programs and opportunities. Uh, my mother dropped out of high school. And if that wasn't bad enough, guess what? My dad dropped out of high school as well. But the, uh, the upside or upshot to it is that by me taking advantage of programs um, and, and opportunities and resources such as this, I now have a PhD and I work for NASA. And I, I often jokingly say my mother does not have a um, high school diploma, but she got a PhD through her son. So uh, this is a very, very important part of my story because there are hundreds of thousands of students out there who have untapped potential just like I did. And they're, they're often forgotten about and, and left over and, and, and left behind. But we want to make certain that we encourage and inspire you all. So that that's the gist of my five minutes right now is I, I want to connect with someone who may feel as if they're being left out or have untapped potential, but just need a little more help to help them get into the aviation industry. I will say this to you all. Hopefully you all have been inspired or encouraged or motivated by something that was said here. Make certain that you, um, if there was one person or two people, Google them, look them up, find their email, find their uh, phone number and shoot them a note and say, hey, I'm really excited about what you shared and I want to land a career in the aviation industry. Can you help me? And, and, and I'm sure they'll be more than, than happy to help you. Last thing I'll say is that um, I also lead a diversity, equity, and inclusion task force. I actually was just recently promoted to NASA's headquarters office to lead a uh, 50 plus member task force across the country that spans over all 10 of our NASA centers for the Office of Communications. So our DEI task force initiative, I'm leading that. And that is very important to me uh, for the reasons that I just stated. Um, a lot of students, believe it or not, um, are intimidated by STEM fields and careers, but we want to show and empower young people to, to uh, believe that they can uh, make their dreams come true in STEM fields, whether it's as an engineer, 
pilot, et cetera, or if it's a support staff person. If you want to be there, if you want to land in, in the industry, we're here, we're here to help you. And we also want to encourage and motivate you to let you know that you can do this thing. And that is all I had to share. Thank you. Congratulations, Dr. Moss. That is fantastic news. Um, I'm I'm definitely going to be looking you up later, uh, taking your word of advice and, and seeing how I could potentially help uh, as part of that panel or as part of that drive. So um, I think that's that is fantastic. So congratulations again. And uh, with that, uh, we can go ahead and open up the floor to uh, any sort of questions that you may have for any of the panelists that you heard from today. Um, feel free to put that in the chat. Uh, we also have a chat feature um, on our Facebook streaming uh, so we can make sure that those questions get to our panelists. So uh, feel free to start shooting them out and we will make sure to answer them as they come. Um, also, if for some reason uh, you have any questions that are unanswered, we'll make sure to get those questions to those panelists so that they can uh, hopefully answer them uh, to you directly. Dr. Matula, hi, this is Karen. I do see a question here that several of our viewers um, ask. And this is open to any of our panelists. How important is it for individuals to pursue internships toward um, being more successful in their career directions? I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna toss that one over to Dr. Moss because I, I think he did a great uh, introduction uh, to start us off. Yeah, one of the things I like to share with uh, students is would you rather have a summer job experience at um, McDonald's on your resume or would you rather have a summer job experience with NASA or Boeing uh, corporate office on your resume? So I think it's a no brainer that individuals would want to have that um, that more professional experience. So internships are simply a way to help you, one, get your foot in the door to help you advance the um, the mission of the organization and also three, help you advance your skill set as well. So with internships, it's not about you just coming, punching the clock and getting a paycheck. It's about you coming, punching the clock, getting a, a paycheck and you growing as a young professional while you're also helping the actual organization grow as well to help help meet their mission and goals. So internships is, is a must. I had seven different internships um, throughout my career and it's ultimately landed me uh, the careers and positions, positions of my dream. So um, internships are must. Thank you, Dr. Moss. I see uh, Les has uh, some input as well. Yeah, I would echo what Dr. Moss said in that even if you do an internship and it turns out not to be your ultimate field, you learn what goes on into the business world and you learn how to interact in that arena. I started off, I did a couple of internships in engineering um, with NOAA, National Atmospheric and um, National, whatever, Atmospheric Administration, um, and ended up in political science and then ended up in IT. But that experience was invaluable to know what I didn't want to do and to know how important it is to, to study and to get an education and have people support me throughout the entire process. I and, completely agree, Les. Thank you so much for your insight. Um, another question that we have uh, is, do you see the retirement age for airline pilots being extended over the next 10 years? I think that was a, a question um, for those that talked about the retirement age of airline pilots and us seeing a decline uh, in pilots over the next few years. Well, there's been a lot of conversation with the FAA over the last uh, several years uh, about increasing the uh, retirement age, uh, especially due to the shortages that we're currently uh, starting to face. And uh, Captain Biddle can probably tell you a little more about that. Um, uh, initially, I think they were looking at, at increasing the age to about 67 and then, and then possibly 69 or 70, as long as an individual is capable of passing a first class uh, medical certificate, they can continue to fly. The, the biggest drawback, though, is, is that uh, the COVID hit us uh, last year and it just kind of 
sidelined to everybody, but at the present time, uh, that has to be something that's mandated through Congress. And Willie, I'll back you up on that. Um, United's modeling is not including that in, in our forecast for pilot hiring. So uh, we're not counting on Congress acting uh, to increase the age anytime soon. And uh, if I could chime in, I, I believe that regardless of the retirement age, we were still seeing a need for pilots uh, in the industry. Uh, that, that is actually uh, correct. Uh, as um, uh, Mr. Burley had indicated earlier, the, the facing of the shortages that we're facing uh, over the next uh, 18, 19 years, uh, we're, we're looking at somewhere in the neighborhood worldwide shortages of about 804,000 pilots, worldwide shortages, flight attendants, about 914,000 flight attendants and 769,000 aircraft mechanics. And, and, and that doesn't include all of the air traffic controllers, uh, all of the other support personnel that the other uh, speakers have indicated that we will need. So it's a huge industry, somewhere in the na neighborhood of about um, 80 million people short worldwide. That's, that is incredible. And it is encouraging to hear that there are support programs to help get you started in the industry as well as, um, you know, get you trained as a pilot because obviously there is a need. So definitely look into those opportunities. Um, a question, a question that I have, um, and we, we touched a little bit on it already, uh, talking about experiences where we uh, kind of figured out what we liked or didn't like. Um, do any of the panelists have an experience that they would like to talk about mm -hmm. where they realized that they actually wanted to be in the aviation industry? Kind of what was that spark that led you um, to where you are today? Well, for me personally, uh uh, it's like with um, uh, Captain Riley, you know, when and uh, he ended up as an astronaut. I grew up in the early uh, 50, late 50s, early 60s. And I remember um, Alan Shepard, uh, Gus Grissom and John Glenn when they first did their first few flights in the early uh, 60s. And for me, there was not a lot of role models. First of all, it was only the initial Mercury 7 astronauts in the early 60s. But what that did, you know, I saw them going up in, the, in a parabolic arc, shooting up in space, coming straight down. And, when, and in 1962, when John Glenn did the first orbit around the planet with the uh, computations of Miss uh, Catherine Johnson, and by the way, he would not have done it had he not received her, uh, her numbers. Um, that, things like that is what inspired me. My father would take us to air shows uh, at, out in Edwards Air Force Base and Palmdale and things like that. And that inspired me to be wanting to be an astronaut. But I ended up on a path to be an airline pilot and not an astronaut because there was not a lot of role models out there. But I, I think it's very important and for our panels and students out there, uh, if they start very early, you know, I, I, I like to use the analogy of uh, Tiger Woods' father started him out when he was about two or three years old hitting a golf club. And, and now, you know, Tiger Woods is the greatest golfer out there, you know, in many people's uh, minds ever. And, and I think we can help develop and create the Tiger Woods of aviation and aerospace industries by implanting that seed and getting them on the path early. Thank you very much for that, Captain Daniels. Uh, I see a hand raised uh, by Dr. James uh, Reilly. Yeah, I want to echo um, a little bit what uh, Dr. Daniels said and also what Mr. Atlas said in that um, aviation is sort of one of those jobs, I think, for many of us is we're sort of born to it. You know, we probably remember all the way back to when we were little kids. I remember just being fascinated by aircraft uh, from the very earliest days. Uh, not ever during that period when I was growing up did I ever feel like there was a chance that I could ever possibly have a hope to become an astronaut. Uh, I just wanted to be an airline pilot, uh, but um, 
somebody mentioned it to me, just like many of us, I think, uh, that we all have mentors. And the fact that somebody is willing to uh, stand up and help you out, as Dr. Moss mentioned, uh, is the critical aspect. And, and that's one of the greatest things about all of these jobs that we've been talking about is the teamwork that goes with it. Every aspect of what we did in space, of course, literally had thousands of people behind us. One of my first jobs in aviation was working the line at Love Field in Dallas, actually pumping fuel into Southwest Airlines' first three 737s back in the day. And you learn that everybody has a role and your job is to do it as best you can uh, so that everything can run smoothly. And you become dependent on, on being able to trust all of those people. Uh, so having that bug, um, getting that early exposure to this um, wonderful world of aviation where everybody has a great day every day. You know, everybody goes to work. You never have a bad day at work. You're not really working, but you're doing the, the vocation that you should be doing. And anybody that spends 43 years working the line as uh, Captain Daniels has done, um, needs to be celebrated. Uh, and the fact that they won't let him retire is, is even more, is more amazing. You know, they were happy to see me leave, I think, but uh, United Airlines is not so happy to see him leave. So they keep finding jobs. That's the important thing, uh, recognizing um, that you have the bug. It's something that you want to do. Finding the people to help you out, re recognizing that teamwork is a critical aspect. Those are all the things that really are looking backwards in my career were the things that uh, helped me be successful just like uh, I think everybody else on this panel. To, to piggyback on that, um, uh, as you mentioned, uh, you never have a bad day in this industry. And I just want to add that Captain Willie Daniels and myself, uh, we've never had a bad day and we've never had a bad hair day. Yeah, uh, the other point that, uh, and <laughs> uh, Dr. Dr. Moss, um, just to, to piggyback on what he said about internships and how important they are, just want to add that we've had we've hired nine of our interns that came through the intern program here at the Ontario International Airport. So uh, it's a great opportunity to be introduced to aviation. Uh, it's a great opportunity to be trained and and learn a lot about the career to determine if that's the path you want to go. Thank you very much for those insights. And, and I personally uh, also second the importance of internships, um, making sure that you get that experience and um, just getting your foot in the door. It, it really opens, opens a world of opportunities once you, once you get there. Um, and keep trying. Um, I, I know that all of us on the panel here have had some uh, faults, have some had some trips, you know, uh, got rejected, and it's one of those where it really hurts. It it does, but keep trying because you will make it eventually. Um, so, speaking off of that, um, we did have somebody ask a question of I'm I'm working on my commercial license, um, and uh, is there Anything that can um, counteract any feelings of, uh, you know, you may have heard imposter syndrome, but more or less um, other resources or opportunities to help get you prepared uh, for um, a career in aviation, whether that be uh, uh, flight clubs, joining honors programs, um, what may be the, the biggest help uh, to getting, uh, um, in the aviation industry or, or uh, becoming a pilot in this industry? Well, well Shades of Blue, we, as I indicated earlier, uh, started this program about 21 years ago, where we we're trying to help uh, build the future workforce for the country. And they can become a member of my organization by joining us at www.ourshadesofblue.org. And um, we actually, uh, get students in the pipeline where we're able to mentor them, point them in the right direction. We actually track them through college. And once they get all of the credentials, um, then, then we help open up the doors by running their resumes right into the HR departments. Um, as, as an airline, um, 
uh, becoming an airline captain, for example, uh, is, is akin to uh, becoming a, a doctor, getting a doctor's degree, because you're, you're spending, uh, not only do you go to college, but you, you're looking at about another uh, five to seven, eight years to uh, get the hours that, that's required in order to become an airline transport uh, pilot. So you're looking at roughly about 1,500 hours of flying time just to get to your, your ATP. And then that's just a starting point for your entry into the airlines. So it sounds like plenty of training, plenty of opportunities to keep honing your skills and uh, working on any sort of um, um, areas of weakness. I, I know I myself uh, uh, have my PPL and um, there are definitely some days with crosswinds that I need to work on that. That is for sure. So um, well, I, I can actually, I can actually say that uh, from the moment you start training, you never stop training. And, and, and I, I tell everybody that gets involved with us, it's like having a bag of knowledge. If the day goes by and you don't learn something new in that day, then that entire day was wasted. So every day you should be learning a new, something new, if it's a new word or if it's a new uh, procedure or process. Every day, you know, you're, you're, as um, Captain Biddle mentioned, they want the best of the best. They want to see everybody continuing to, to um, uh, you know, do the, strive to do the best. Because, like, when I flew the 747, we would carry uh, uh, 400 passengers halfway, a quarter of the way around the world nonstop for 14 and a half hours. We load an aircraft up. It has 875,000 pounds of weight. 388,000 pounds of fuel on board, which was equivalent to 57,000 gallons of fuel. And so, and, and so you, it's like launching a ship, but you think about having 400 lives in your hands. And so you have to be the best that you can be in order to continually get people from point A to B safely, because they want to go across the world, visit their family, their friends, their jobs, and come back home safely and, and, and say, I had a great time doing that. Thank you very much. Uh, at this time, I don't see any uh, further questions and we are just a little bit over our time. So I wanna make sure to uh, recognize everybody again for their participation and, and thank you so much for um, you know, letting us have part of your evening. Uh, we're all very busy, but uh, you, you all have inspired us and, and you know, really encouraged us in uh, these careers in aviation. So thank you very much. Well, I would like to say thank you, Dr. Matula, for walking us through this very awesome webinar. To each of our presenters, oh my goodness, give yourselves an applause. This was wonderful, wonderful. All the information coming from each of you and uh, um, just sharing your personal stories as well. It's, it's priceless, just priceless. Um, Paul Pastorick, our president, I think he may have stepped away, but he sent an email just applauding you and applauding this wonderful panel that has been brought together. So I'm gonna ask Michael if you can um, pull up the next slide, I believe it's 64, in our deck. Um, I like to call names, say my name, say my name. So in my thank you, I'm going to say our names right now. President Paul Pastorick, Werner Petzl, Captain Willie Daniels, what would we do without you? We know why United is not letting you go. We're not letting you go either. Michael Hayden, Dr. Pete Lamone, Dr. Jeff Forrest, Emily Matula, as I mentioned before, James F. Riley, Joel Brule, Brule, Captain Rob Biddle, Bruce Atlas, Adam Zayer, Les Berry, and Dr. Antoine D. Moss, and Stephanie Ra Richland. You are indeed awesome. And so we thank you, we thank you, we thank you. I did place in the um, chat the links to each of our organizations, University of Arizona Global Campus, the Metro State University of Denver, and Shades of Blue. Contact us reach out to us. If we've learned anything from this session, connections, relationships, 
are very, very important. Look at the relationships amongst the panelists here that we have pulled together um, today. And I'm just going to restate the jobs in the aviation industry, 87.7 million jobs and growing. If you are looking to expand your career, if you're looking to get into an industry that is moving places, that is elevating, going higher, check out the aviation industry. Reach out to individuals who are on this panel. Go to LinkedIn. As you see the names, go to LinkedIn and request to partner with individuals, connect with individuals and stay connected. Um, as we have mentioned as well, the various opportunities in the aviation industry, um, we hear of traditional positions such as the pilot, the um, flight attendant, the traffic controller. But let us not forget, as we have talked during this presentation, all of those other opportunities and career paths that are available in the aviation industry, all within the business of aviation is huge, is great, it is wonderful. So to close us out again, just want to say thank you to all of our panel members. Thank you to all who attended, all who attended through Facebook and other links as well, and those who will watch this in replay. We appreciate you, panelists. We appreciate you. Um, if you pan panelists can hold on once we do disconnect for a photo op. Yes, we do take pictures virtually. Um, we want to do that as well to put you in our brand books. So thank you once again and enjoy your evening, enjoy your day. Take care.